And so I had been saying 2024 for hyper-Bitcoinization for many years. And even total Bitcoiners said, that's too early. I said, it's not that I know Bitcoin is so great. I can see the rate of decay. The rate of decay of fiat is so fast. People for years would ask me, what keeps you up at night? I would say that we're not ready for the decay. That we're not ready. That, that mm. the thing is breaking so much faster than I can imagine that we're just not ready to absorb what we have to absorb, which is the entire concept of how you measure wealth and energy markets and all these other things. So the psychology is important. The rate of decay of the other system is important. And that's what's allowing us to be successful, I think. All right, Nolan Bowerly, welcome to Bitcoin for Millennials. Thanks for having me, man. This is great. We've been trying to get this done for a few months now, huh? Yes. Yes, we're finally we're finally here, and I think uh, just before we started, I showed you uh, my um, an interaction of myself with uh, with an NPC. I think <laughs> we will talk about that uh, about about your Bitcoiner um, Bitcoiner guy to to NPC management and and a lot of more stuff. But I wanted to start with uh, your own Bitcoin journey. You've been in Bitcoin for quite some time. Did you get it on the first encounter? How did you get it or why didn't you get it? I mean, no, you know, no one I think gets it the first time, but I had a bit of an advantage in that mm. uh, I was studying. I was a lawyer in this totally separate life that we all lived before Bitcoin. And I was studying the basically FATF in Europe. So the $10,000 thing you have to sign when you cross borders, right? The money laundering rules. Now, it was a political wedge issue when I was studying it for the Senate Banking Committee in that we knew we had some weird thing where Parisians were telling small rural banks that they had to hire compliance officers and we thought we could make a story out of it, right? So that's often what goes on in these parliamentary committees or these congressional committees is you study something and then really it's to sort of hijack the news. My job was to hijack the news. That was what I did, right? So we found this issue. And I became an expert in it, and I got both liberals, conservatives, everyone on both sides of the aisle very furious because what we found out was they were not actually catching any money launderers with this $10,000 thing, right? It was a total scam. And I got even a lot of the liberals. I was working for a conservative political, you know, the conservative political party in power at the time, and I was arguing that this was a useless regime, and everybody agreed. So I already had an understanding of what a hollow regulatory environment there was for catching money mm. launders and it looked a bit sketchy and a bit corrupt and but in that study it was 2012 i learned about bitcoin so the way it was presented to me which was like an fbi officer telling us about how hard their job you know this police it's always so hard it's so hard i gotta be a policeman i gotta catch criminals and they don't like it so they wanted they were all for the data they were like and we can't do it enough right so they were telling me they needed more powers to go after people and more investigative stuff. And they said, and wait, do you see this Bitcoin thing? And so already in my mind, I'm thinking that this detective or whatever this guy does for a living is a, is a parasite and a vulture. And then he says something about how impressed he is by Bitcoin. And I said, what? What is that? Right. Go back to that. What was that thing that you just mentioned? And so I didn't know anything about cryptography. And suddenly I kind of realized I had this blind spot, right, about mm -hmm. what cryptography was and what it could do and and because i understood that it was based on cryptocurrencies and cryptography and i didn't know anything about that so now i used my education in law which is pretty good at learning how to think right learning how to break a problem down so i started doing mm -hmm. that and so there wasn't much of a delay in the sense that that i um i didn't really ignore it from the start i understood something big was happening and then i knew i had a whole field of information i knew nothing about and so I just drove at that. And then I got the Senate to do a study back then in 2013, uh, because then I became obsessed. This sort of coincided with one of the original price spikes that I got interested and then the price went up. So this was one of those positive feedback loop things that we were talking about where I was like, wait a minute, I'm a genius. It's yeah. going crazy, right? So uh, this report ended up being a pretty big success. We had Andreas Antonopoulos as one of our witnesses. It was one of the earliest instances where a government, whatever, study didn't look at the criminality, we were looking at the potential upside for humanity. Mm -hmm. And that was a pretty liberating thing to, to go and do. And, and it was a wonderful study. I got a really, a really lucky thing also happened to me during the study, which was I would live in Toronto. I was living in Toronto at the time. 
and I would do a uh, back and forth between the capital of Canada, Ottawa, and Toronto. I was constantly commuting, but no one paid me to do that commute. I was just a researcher. So there wasn't like a travel budget. So I would do ride share with people. I would pick people up and mm-hmm. I would drive them. And one day it would have been early 2014. Uh, I would already, I'd already started the study. I was already committed a hundred percent. All I'm thinking about is Bitcoin. I'm going crazy. No one knows what I'm talking about. Right. And, and so I go to pick up these folks at a gas station, but right next to it, there was this place in Toronto that became the first ever ATM where Vitalik Buterin was working, where he'd started Bitcoin magazine. And, uh, he was doing the white paper for Ethereum then, but I walked in and they were all kind of there. And I, I knew who he was because I knew what little media there was in the industry. And so I kind of just plopped down and sat there and I kind of never left. I, I picked up my rides and I went back. But as time went on, I brought all those people in from that workplace. They're the ones who got Andreas so that cool. we could you know, have mm-hmm. him at the event. Um, ended up being just a great, almost like a newsroom. I have really fond memories. It was psycho people everywhere. Everyone was going crazy. That's where the whole Ethereum thing was launched out of. It was just a lot of fun, really wild. And uh, what happened to me in the end was... I used their expertise to do a publicity stunt, which was when we tabled the report in Parliament in Ottawa, we also also did the op return uh, script to hash it into Bitcoin's blockchain and it ended up mm-hmm. getting picked up by a bunch of media outlets, Vice, which was big at the time. A few people picked it up and it became sort of a story. And that's how I got in touch with the Coindesk people. And this was about the time when Coindesk was going to be bought by Barry Silbert and brought to New York City. So when that happened, I moved to New York City and started with the early Coindesk team, building out the event and the data tools. And I did a lot of the public speaking for Coindesk for a number of years. So I was the guy who would go on CNN and CNBC and all the fake news. It was always the same thing, though. Bitcoin up, Bitcoin down, hack. Bitcoin up, Bitcoin down. Yeah. It was the same show every day, but it was fun. We had a lot of fun doing it. I loved it. Um, And then I did a bit of time back with the Kraken and and then moved on to Bitcoin Magazine in 2021 uh, because they started being interested in doing live events. uh, And that was something that they were no longer doing because of COVID. So that's how the trajectory Mm. went. You quickly brushed over, or you went from, I didn't know, anything about cryptography, etc. to all I could think about was uh, Bitcoin. Like in between, w- what was your aha moment? What what was the moment where it clicked? Like you went deep on the fiat money system. So that's a good prerequisite, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think we'll talk about this, but like a lot of people don't understand the fiat money system, right? So they also don't really understand the problem that they have and why Bitcoin might be the solution. What made it click for you? What was in between these two stages? I was, as someone who was already interested in propaganda and persuasion and the the propaganda battle, I could tell the global warming scam was going to become even worse and it was going to be used even more thoroughly. So I understood right away the only way out of this was the innovator's dilemma, which was to innovate in energy. And one of the ways to innovate in energy. So these were the, these were the obsessions and subcurrents that I had when I got into Bitcoin. Mm. I was very interested in accessible capital markets. So I understood that the Savings and Investment Act in the United States in 1932 and 1933, which limited who could invest in what and what access people had and all that kind of stuff. I understood all that was a major problem already. So because I was interested in the early parts of energy literacy, and I, I, I should also say that I had a tremendous advantage in that um, being uh, everything that I just explained about Toronto and Decentral, a lot of the Bitcoin core devs were actually working in this environment in the sense that Blockstream is actually a Montreal-based company. And so this is a, a world that I was operating in. The original scaling Bitcoin conference took place here in Montreal in those years. So suddenly I had access to a bunch of core devs that were just hanging out. They were just hanging out. So they were already treating Bitcoin as a 100% certainty that it was happening and that it couldn't be stopped already. They were already existing on a Bitcoin standard and all of these conversations mm-hmm. were already happening. So it was more that, that, the, that I thought I was smart. I got involved, found out that almost every one of the clever ideas I had had already been thought of. And I couldn't believe that these people were already existing. I mean, understand this is 2014. 
There mm -hmm. are already people operating in 2014 on a 100% certainty that this is happening and it can't be stopped. Does your Bitcoin custody setup keep you up at night? Gain peace of mind with OnRamp and their multi-institution custody solution. OnRamp creates a dedicated multi-signature vault for you and three separate institutions each hold a key, which are OnRamp, Bitco, and CoinCover. But none of them can move funds unilaterally, only you have control. These institutions can only sign with your instruction. OnRamp's multi-institution custody eliminates single points of failure, reduces your personal attack service and technical burden, and provides access to financial services that allow you to secure your Bitcoin, including inheritance planning, insurance-backed warranties for all balances and transactions, low-cost trading, and more. Check out onrampbitcoin.com through my link in the description below and receive $250 in Bitcoin when you join. If you want to self-custody your Bitcoin stack, I recommend the Foundation Passport, a premium Bitcoin-only hardware wallet. I've been using mine for about a year now, and I love the design and ease of use. And with Foundation's mobile wallet companion app Envoy, your initial onboarding is super smooth and straightforward. The Passport is fully air-gapped, which means you never have to connect it to the internet or any computer. The Passport serves as a signing device to sign transactions on your Envoy app, or any of your other favorite software wallets like Sparrow or Blue Wallet. The Foundation Passport also offers encrypted backups on a micro SD card and is built with 100% open source hardware and software. I love what Zach and the team at Foundation are building. And to learn more about their mission, please check out episode 27 of this podcast. If you consider buying a Foundation Passport, you can use code BRAM, that's B-R-A-M, to get $10 off at foundation.xyz slash BRAM. And the enthusiasm those people had was very infectious, intoxicating, whatever you want to call it. And yeah. uh, so the, the, the piece that I learned, understanding that I needed to know more about cryptography, I did the basic learning methods. I learned all about Whitfield Diffie and I read the Bruce Schneier stuff. I read some of the history of cryptography. But you can actually just take every one of the 1990s debates uh, from the clipper chip and everything that went on about encryption and third party backdoors and everything. And you can put it right into the Bitcoin conversation. It's the same conversation. So all of that stuff read very timely. Uh, and then of course I started to get interested in Xabo who couldn't, uh, especially in those days. And so he would still writing current stuff. He would come out with new articles every couple of months. And so we were all caught up in what the Bitcoin rabbit hole already was, which was a reading list and a list of things you got to learn about and understand. And so I haven't really gone into the psychology yet. That came later. Uh, I think that's something that I started to pick on, you know, pick up and, and figure out as time went on. Exactly yeah. because when I when I got into the Bitcoin magazine and CoinDesk stuff before that, it was all about you know it's evangelism. It's basically okay. Uh, education is what's needed. Uh, I think Andreas has the entire market occupied for what he does. What other niche places can I go educate people? I chose Wall Street, so that's why I went to Wall Street and did that. I still had to learn a lot about Wall Street, but I learned about Wall Street from a Bitcoin lens. And, and I guess you can say that, that that helped me in immeasurable ways, which is, you know, I was a financial illiterate before Bitcoin. I was working on the Senate Banking Committee. I understood all kinds of banking law. I was a, not a really, I never went to bar school and passed a bar exam, but I had finished law school. I could have practiced as a lawyer. I was an idiot. I didn't know anything. And then I realized nobody in this culture knows anything, nothing. So, and as I said, I was already interested in innovators dilemma. I knew that markets needed some form of democratization. I was very keen on the ICO uh, stuff in the early days. Very keen. Mm. I thought, and I still am very proud of what happened. I think, I love the beauty and the chaos of it, right? It's, it's, it's been Me great too. to watch. <laughs> yeah, it's just great. I love that stuff, right? So I don't, I tell the people all the time, it's very dangerous, you know, it's gambling. It's a totally well, it's different the wild sport. West. It's, it's the, the wild, wild west, west of a new technology, right? And that if you approach it like that, then it's uh, really fun. It so uh, makes me think of a moment where I, I had an interview. Uh, this was when I worked at a TradFi bank. And I was big into crypto, Bitcoin. And I had an interview for like the eight o'clock news, standing outside in front, uh, during my work time, standing outside in front of the big bank building in, in like the business district. And I remember talking about ICOs, but I put my Bitcoin pin on my jacket. So I was standing there at the eight o'clock news with my Bitcoin pin and talking about ICOs, just saying like, 
you know, this is a wild west. Like just, yeah. you know, you, uh, you, uh, you know, don't, don't gamble, gamble what you can't lose, but it's fascinating, you know? True. Um, yeah, that's, it's, it's so fun. It's also really interesting. You, you point towards, you know, your, your, your finance and literacy. Uh, I, I have the same, right? Let, I, I do not have an economic background or a finance background. And I've had plenty of people tell me that's actually what helps you understand Bitcoin, that you are not sucked into <laughs> this, you know, finance or, or econ world, because it's really just a one way street of certain type of ideology way of working. Uh, I had on Leon Wankum, who's a, I think it's master of economics. And he told me I've never learned what money is. Yeah. Fascinating. <laughs> right. That's, mm -hmm. that's, uh, I think what you, what you just, uh, uh, alluded to also that, you know, even the people that should know have no clue. I think that's one of the biggest pills that you can take. I don't know which color that pill has, right? But, but once you get to that point where you know that, you know, the experts are not, are not all experts and they are not acting in a way that is always beneficial to you, right? I think that's. One of the well, that's, one, that's one thing we try and do on the morning show all the time is talk, and this is important in Bitcoin. It's the Gelman amnesia effect. If you don't know mm. what the Murray Gelman amnesia effect is, I'll explain no. it. It's very simple. You know, who Michael Crichton is. Do you remember who Michael Crichton is? He was no. the writer of Jurassic Park. Um, okay. So Michael Crichton was like a giant. He was like a Dutch-sized fella. He was like almost seven feet tall, right? Just an enormous person. And he wrote a bunch of sci science fiction books, but he was also a medical doctor. He made his true fortune off of a television show called ER, which used to come on the, the mm -hmm. best sort of American, yeah. you know, Thursday night after Seinfeld and Friends and it had George Clooney and it was a huge exactly, hit. Yeah. He only wrote one up, he owned it. So he got a lot of income and revenue from it. So he was a intellectual in America that every president wanted to have dinner with privately, that everyone, he was kind of a, in the same way that people might think of Elon Musk that way these days, right? Just someone who's so fascinating, you want to spend time with them. Now it's it's a you know not quite the same level of genius, but um, nevertheless an incredible guy. So he came up with this Gelman amnesia idea, which is this, and he named it after Murray Gelman, who's a friend of his who won the Nobel Prize in physics, who was guilty of it, and he wanted to use it just to impress everyone. So don't even worry about the name Gelman amnesia, is just because it's this guy. Mm -hmm. So what happened was Gelman was reading the newspaper. And Gelman saw a story about something he knew about, right? It was his field to which he won a Nobel Prize already. And he says, look at these idiots. How dumb could they be? Look at them talking about this stuff. They, they're so stupid. They're so dumb. It's the same thing we see when the fake news talks about Bitcoin. Yes. Every single yes. Bitcoin article yes. you read yes. and you go, look at these people. Yes. Oh my God, who could be dumber? Yes. But yes. then the Gelman amnesia is that he flipped the newspaper. And this is what got Michael Crichton crazy. He mm. flipped the newspaper I, and he I took the know next it. story yeah. seriously. The next yes. story, he was yes. like, did you read about this thing in Israel? Yes. yes. Did you read about this, I know, this I historic knew this. thing? Yeah. yeah. So I, I did. Yeah. I didn't know this was the name, but I know this principle. Yes. Yeah. Yellow man amnesia. And yeah. it's, it's what makes the fiat world go round. If they didn't have the gel man amnesia, I mean, I don't think the thing would work. Right. I think it kind of ties into, um, I was listening to uh, a podcast uh, with uh, Andrew Bustamante, you know, like the, that CIA guy with like the curls, the ex CIA guy. And he also says, like, if you, um, if you want to do something that's ridiculous or very bad, you have to go like over the top bad because then no one, uh, no one will believe you, right? Like mm -hmm. you, you should not do a bad thing. You should do a horrible thing. Right. And then if people tell other people like, oh, this happened and other people would be like, no, that sounds way too, way too crazy. Right. And then the entire thing gets dismissed basically. And, uh, yeah, it's funny. Like I'm, I'm thinking about that. That's what, what's being done all the time. Right. Um, but it also works against us. I would say as Bitcoiners, I, I, ha I, I know exactly what you're saying when you talk about this. That I have this with Bitcoin as well. I've been in, uh, I'm in a telegram group with like, politicians and journalists and you know uh, in my in my country and of the biggest financial newspaper uh there's there's three guys that and sometimes they write about bitcoin and then i always reply like this is the biggest you know discovery in your entire you know uh industry right yeah. the entire topic that you focus on 
there's only two options for me. And, and they talk about it, you know, like Ponzi scheme pyramid, blah, blah, blah. And I say, okay, either you have no clue. You, you did not, you, you don't understand what this is. You did the work, but you don't understand. So I don't know, you know, you, you, you have a certain problem or you did the work, you know, the threat th- that it is. And that's why you write this nonsense about it. Right. And I had them reply one time. This guy was like, no, no, this is just uh, filling the newspaper and uh, uh, helping people not, <laughs> not to make the mistake of getting uh, Bitcoin. And I was like, who, who do you think you are? Right. Like, and it was a big moment for me when I had this realization that you just explained. Like, okay, if this is the case in the biggest financial newspaper of my country, what else is not true? Because I know this subject very, very well. Right. Yeah, and this is the that. attitude of the editors of the finance. Um, it's, it's a line I've been using for a little while because there's a propaganda payload for the NPCs in America right now mm-hmm. called defending your democracy, right? That's what they're all, we have to defend our democracy and censor everybody. We have to defend our democracy and stop Bitcoin. We have to defend, you know, the defending the democracy thing. So now I call it democracy. It's, it's You're either, if you got to support the way they're talking about, like these guys writing for the newspaper, you're either dumb or crazy. It's dumb or crazy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's not democracy anymore. It's dumb yeah. or crazy. Yeah. Dumb or crazy. Because otherwise, it, there's only two explanations. Either they're but nuts. Exactly. They're exactly. completely nuts, or they're just stupid. Yes. Now, again, it's not an IQ problem, though. The problem no. really is with reality. It's like what, I mean, it's another thing that Peter Thiel was talking about on the Joe Rogan show he did the other day, which is that Bitcoin is such a big idea. And it is. The idea is so large that people can't get their minds around it. Again, why I call my show The Breakup, because... You're dealing with the end, you know, time is money. And when you end a certain time and you end a certain money, you're, you're ending an era. You're ending more than just the money and the means of exchange and the unit of account. You're actually ending a worldview. And Bitcoin yes. is a worldview. That's again, why I'm not sort of threatened or even consider a crypto. Crypto is a hobby that is funny and it's like baseball cards and it's like sports or something like that. Right. But Bitcoin is an actual worldview. And because it's a worldview, you can understand everything there is to understand with it. It's a psychological phenomenon. It's a psychological commodity. And the psychology that perpetuates it is really what will allow us to win. Because we understand the difference between fake news and we understand the Gelman yeah. amnesia, and because we can actually agree that there is no data in the world worth a damn. There is only one data point. There is only one worth anything in the world. And that's what's happening on the Bitcoin blockchain. All the rest is subject to interpretation, to the forces of entropy, the forces of human manipulation. That is the one that isn't. And we can do a lot with that. We can rebuild the world from that. So that's that's the good news. That's yeah. why you don't have to be blackpilled. Who could be blackpilled on days like now? The things are going great. Yes, I, f- I fully agree. I think that's also the bigger shift in general, right? From the nihilism to the optimism. Uh, I really think Bitcoin is a vehicle to help us get to this optimistic side, or at least have a group of people that are optimistic, right? And share that with the world. And, and you know, to your credentialist friends in Europe, for example, that, that are being told right now, Elon Musk is a threat to European, you know, mm. think about the world we're in now, where some Belgian it's guy... Wild. Yeah. Is telling Americans that they have to send this is this is the best way of putting all this stuff right all the the censorship about the Donald Trump thing and whatever an unelected that, Belgian guy yeah, right. that, that he says so number one uh, Americans must send their plain text to Belgium first number two <laughs> Americans don't send their plain text to Belgium three uh, what's next I don't know <laughs> that's his whole plan it's yeah. it's thoroughly unserious and mentally retarded to yeah. argue for that kind of a thing. But but the NPCs think it's totally normal. But we, we don't live in that world anymore. We don't have to listen to them. They abdicated whatever authority mm. they had over people during COVID. And what that did, I know when I saw the lies coming out hot and heavy in COVID, I basically felt like the magic spell of fiat had broken over me. I owed them nothing. Anymore. I felt like, okay, you're going to throw me into harm's way like this. You're just going to lie. You can lie to the sledge people. That's fine. Go ahead. I understand why you have to lie, but we're not doing this thing where I pretend you're, you're being honest. I know you're lying. So we're done. Like I'm going to live my own life and I'm going to break whatever rule I feel like. 
I made it my purpose during COVID to uh, scam and doctor my uh, fake COVID tests when I crossed borders to just fake as much stuff as I could because I knew whatever tech they were trying to unleash to keep people limited in their motions was going to be so low quality and so low IQ developed that there's no reason a Bitcoiner should ever follow it. There was just none at all. I knew how it was built. I knew what was underneath the hood. I knew that any one of those apps would not understand that the thing had been photocopied or that it had been doctored. And it was easy to scan it. And that was from then on, I had trained myself to just not listen anymore. And I think a lot of people did the same. Yeah, I think what really helps for me is this kind of like mental model where I think like all these other people are just other people, you know, and and they all have their own individual issues uh, or circumstances, right? Or ego and all these things. And so I I truly feel that with Bitcoin and I want to dive into why this is such a tool to counteract all this political and industrial persuasion, right? But I really feel like once you adopt it, it's it's like a shield, you know, it shields you from all this nonsense. Yeah. And I think that can go in many different ways. You know, I uh, had a conversation with someone about taxes, for example, right? And imagine that uh, because everyone is an individual and, bi and Bitcoin is a mind virus, right? So let's say you have a guy from the tax agency who calls 10 Bitcoiners and is like, well, you you have to pay like X amount of taxes, right? And, 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 and one by one, they all say like Bitcoin. Yeah. Yeah. I did something with Bitcoin, but I lost, uh, there's this key, right? That you need. And I, I, I lost it in, um, in a boating accident. So yeah, I, I don't really have it anymore because I don't, I don't have my key. Yeah. Yeah. But, but here on my paper, you know, it, it, it says you have Bitcoin. Yeah. Dude, I, I don't know. Like I cannot access it. <laughs> okay. You know, he hangs up and he calls the other, the other, the other 10, the other nine Bitcoiners. And after calling with 10 of these people is like, who, who are, who are these people? You know, wh what is going on here? You know, and then it's five o'clock. He shuts down his computer, goes to the grocery store. He wants to buy a watermelon for $25. Right. And, and, and a pack of milk for $10. It's like, what the, what the fuck is going on with my life? Maybe I should study this Bitcoin thing because these people on the phone sounded pretty happy <laughs> and he didn't really care about the fact that I was calling, you know, and that's, I think how eventually the mind virus uh, grows because you're shielded from this nonsense, right? Like you can, we can go into a whole debate about taxes, but I'm more saying like the, the era of just doing what the government tells you to do is kind of over. Yeah. And there's a tool that you have that you can use to battle against this nonsense, right? Like I'm not saying all oh, government is bad and all these things. They have to be kept in check, which mm -hmm. is not the case currently, right? Um, but I think Bitcoin is, is a tool to do that on. Lots of different um, levels and, and, and topics, basically. And I already had the confirmation, as, uh, especially in my country, or definitely in my country, uh, no, sorry, mainly in my country, that I know that a lot of people at, in certain places who manage pretty important institutions are Bitcoiners, you know? So mm -hmm. I, think, I think that is fascinating, that individual, mm, how do you say, like the, the individual... Um, your in the individual life is way more important than the institution that these people work well, for. You know, again, again, we're in a psychological war. World War Three yes. is a psychological and economic war, and even the concept of fiat, right? It just means government words. They made government words into money, so it requires its perpetuation by the actual words. The yes. manipulation, the propaganda, must be there. Otherwise, the thing sputters. And can't find any form of perpetuation. What yeah, they have to keep up Bitcoin, the trust, you mean. Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Bitcoin perpetuates forward because, and will continue to per perpetuate forward because literally our, psycholog our psychology, our ability to have confidence in the person at the other end of the transaction and other Bitcoiners is much stronger than other people. You know, as someone who does these big events, right? I helped produce the one this summer in Nashville with Donald Trump and all these other people. And we've been doing this thing for a long time. And if you remember coming out of 2021, Bitcoin Magazine was the first event, the first group on earth, on the planet, on our entire planet to come out and do an event with no masks. They did at the beginning of June, 2021, 12,000 people indoors, no mask, no vaccines, nothing. 
And no one in the world had met in public like that yet. No one. And we did it. And the reason why we were capable of doing that is because we were the least affected psychologically by COVID. We were the most able to push through the propaganda, push through the coordination, push through the lies, push through whatever it was. Who cares what it was? It doesn't matter. We were able to push through it, meet in confidence. And I think history is going to remark this. This was an important thing. And the entire P2P network in the end, right? Remember, it's a P2P electronic cash number. What we've learned is that meetup culture, for example, Bitcoin meetup culture has superseded any university in teaching uh, financial literacy, in teaching energy literacy, in teaching media literacy. It's not even close. When we do the events, we're really just trying to capture the spirit of Bitcoin meetup, which has created these humans that are much, much, much stronger, much more resilient economically, much more resilient psychologically to what's going on in this fiat apocalypse. It's much easier for them because the world is going according to their plans. Everything that I mentioned earlier about 2014 with all those guys, guess whose time frame we're on? <laughs> those crazy <laughs> Bitcoin devs who assumed we had already won in 2014 and it couldn't be stopped. We're in the exact world they predicted would be here now, and it's here. And so I've been saying 2024 for hyper-Bitcoinization for many years. And even, you know, total Bitcoiners said that's too early. I said, it's not that I know Bitcoin is so great. I can see the rate of decay. The rate of decay of fiat is so fast. People for years would, uh, would ask me, what keeps you up at night? I would say that we're not ready for the decay, that we're not ready, that, that mm -hmm. the thing is breaking so much faster than I can imagine, that we're just not ready to absorb what we have to absorb, uh, which is the entire concept of how you measure wealth and energy markets and all these other things. So, yeah. you know, the, the psychology is important. The rate of decay of the other system is important. And that's what's allowing us to be successful, I think. Yeah. So I think we, we, we pretty much discussed it, but maybe if there's anything to add, like, so how could we see Bitcoin as a tool to counteract or expose all this persuasion that, that we are exposed to? all the time what what's it's a follow the money that? it's a follow the money situation it's always a follow yeah. the money situation uh you know we're not rational we're not logical you have to look at who benefits who benefits from this or that now bitcoin is not going to solve greed it's not going to solve any of that stuff right so that's all possible that's all going to continue but when you're dealing with proximity to a printer as the reason for which you're having success or not. Just look at education, for example, yeah. right? Look at the U.S. public education system. I'm sure it's the same in Europe. So who's the customer? The customer in the end is the government because they're the mm -hmm. ones paying the bills. So follow the money. You don't need a conspiracy to understand any of this stuff. Education is perfect. The customer in this case is the government. They print money. And so the entire system is going to be oriented towards the customer. And in education in America, it can be very similar, right? We can see that the, the customer is the teachers unions and things like that. Now we can do one better. We can do one better. We can do uh, charter schools, which is catching on in America. Most of the states are going to that where you're, you basically get a coupon, right? Say your student, your child would cost for going to public education, going to the public school, say it would cost the state 20,000 euros or something like that. Well, mm -hmm. in a lot of states in my state in Vermont, that's what you get. You get a coupon for what the government would give you to go to public school and you withdraw it, you can spend that money where you want to spend it in private classes and all that kind of stuff. Now that works, but that still requires the parent to be the customer because that, that's a good start, right? The parent mm -hmm. is being the customer. But Bitcoin goes one step further than that. Bitcoin goes one step further in education in that, uh, again, follow the money here, right? Follow the money. When Bitcoiners set up their P2P system, it became, and the meetup culture, it became a thing where individuals who had the time, effort, patience, and were in that spot could provide a service that people could choose individually to access or not. And so in the end, the customer became where you spend your time. It became the people who wanted to spend time at a Bitcoin meetup in order to learn and better themselves. And so the customer in the Bitcoin meetup culture is the person who just wants to know what the hell's going on. Yeah. What is happening to my money? What is happening to that? And that is the, that is where education is headed. Now, yeah. I'm very happy that we're doing the charter thing in America. A lot of families are going to be successful, but you still need one parent who's an active consumer and is spending money to make sure their kid gets a good education. We're going to fix a lot more that way, but it's not the end of the road. The end of the road 
is when these things are created as a public utility out of, honestly, the generosity and thoughtfulness of the people who have the capacity to do it, thinking of the needs of the people who could require this thing. And that's something that we've seen in Bitcoin at a scale that no one else is able to, to copy. Just look at why it's so popular in markets. Is it normal that Lynn Alden, Willie Wu, and all of these people who would otherwise just offer asymmetric advantage to the people who pay them have shared their information publicly. This yeah. is a this is a, a very unique thing in human history, and I think will continue to be one of the ways we we win this war is that our education is so much better. The events bring it in. You know, people ask me about these events. How big they can they get? I said, well, uh, how big are universities in America? Because they're not doing the job. They're terrible. They're useless. I mean, we run circles around them. We give the entire university experience in three or four days and we whoop their ass. It's not even close. It's not even close. So that that's where this stuff is headed. Yeah. When you, when you say it's psychological, I, I also have to think about literally what you just described for me is internet mindset. It, it's, it's what yeah. the internet gave us, right? Like if you are good enough and interested enough and motivated enough, You will not only share what you know, but you will learn other stuff that you find on the internet, right? Like it's just that, that kind of feedback loop is, is already there on the internet, but I feel like Agreed. Bitcoin translates it to, well, the real life. Yeah. And, and what this is trying to represent is a, is a meme that Greg Gutfeld uses. He's a very popular American television host. And he calls it the fake prison of two ideas. And that's really how fiat culture has operated for a long time. They give you a fake choice yes. and you end up perpetuating within this rage cycle of fake decisions. Yeah. And so that's why I wrote the Bitcoiners Guide to NPC Management, because with these hypnotized people, you can't just, it's not, it's not facts. They're not going to work. And it's the same with the Bitcoin, with the people who want to be no coiners. It's not an IQ problem. I've, I, I know a lot of smart people. I know a lot of people who were good at tons of stuff, good at school, good grades, very successful, but they can't look at it because what it means psychologically to them is that everything they've done for years is trash. It's garbage. It was a waste of their time. Their whole career is a joke, stupid, yeah. useless. And yeah. so that's hard for people, right? So it is internet culture at once, but those are the people who kind of have nothing to lose in a way, right? So those are the ones that have nothing to lose. You can... Go back into the American Revolution, just to even understand how unique this is, right? The American Revolution is a, is a unique thing in history because it wasn't the people with nothing to lose that jumped in two feet first. It was the people with everything to lose. There's no other revolution in the history of the world that was that. There was no other revolution where the people with everything, George Washington, in a patrician world, George Washington is the richest man in the world. He had thousands of acres of Virginia farmland. <laughs> He's a very yeah. rich guy, right? He had nothing at all to gain from what he did. And so that frame is what we're already seeing in Bitcoin as well, right? We are seeing some of these people that have a lot to lose putting their neck out for Bitcoin. And that's an important thing. And it's, it's going to continue to get attention because the people with everything to lose, it's a hypnoti hypnotized problem. It's a, it's a reality problem. They're doing what you're talking about, waiting for instructions. What do I have to think about this? What do I have to think about that? We can be prompt engineered too, Bitcoiners, right? We can be easily prompt engineered. You see people online all the time that are Bitcoiners getting all hot and excited about stuff, whatever it is, right? Someone's pushing their button too. We're not immune to it. We're mm -hmm. not immune. But the motivations are different. We can figure it out better. We can see the spin a little better. We can see the follow the money piece just more clearly. There is a feedback loop. We know who's getting fake money. We know who's getting bought off and paid and all that stuff. I think it's kind of, um, it, when you really study Bitcoin and it takes time, right? And it clicks for you, you understand that this is a thing I can totally verify by myself. And therefore the result of that is that there is a topic where you can fully trust yourself in the conviction that you have around it, right? I feel this is also part of the pill or what you talk about, right? Because if this is with one topic, Is there another topic as well, right? That you mentioned like your your education, like learning how to think, basically, not getting stuff, you know, just uh accepting stuff at face value, which is the easiest, of course, but because you already 
went through this journey with Bitcoin, you understand that you have to go beyond what you thought you you knew or what you thought you believed, right? And I think that's kind of what gives you the certain trust in yourself to also look at all these other things, right? Because you're showing me the meme, you know, that this this uh, right left thing, and I feel like. Uh, for as long as I can remember, I thought the opposite of a bad idea can also be a bad idea, right? And you see people in the real world battle with bad ideas, but there's this whole new orange realm around it, right? The paradigm shift, I think, as Jeff Booth says, that's just totally disconnected from this weird fight well, that's going on. So I'll even, I'll even, uh, one of the other frames that I use for this and a lot of my other work and where I'm sort of headed with this too is gets into some Jungian psychology. If you don't know what Jungian psychology is, um, you know, it, it has to mm. do with your shadow, right? Your collective unconscious. Yeah. And you've heard pretty big subject these days with Austrian school of economics, because of course, Austrian school versus the Keynesian school doesn't think of it as math and science. Again, they bring it back to the psychological frame. And when I think of the process, right, so there's a process in Jungian psychology, and it begins with encounter, right? You have to encounter your shadow. You have to admit it's there. That's that feedback yeah, loop. Exactly. Again, now yeah. it happens on an individual level, and it can happen on a societal level. But that's what's breaking down. When you literally can't count the money, when the denominator is infinity, when you're dealing with an infinity denominator in fiat, there is no way to reference anything. So... You can't actually have an encounter with this dark side. America, for example, cannot at present encounter its shadow as being a war financier. It doesn't allow it to do it. The propaganda will pay for American psychology to not encounter what it actually is. Yeah. It hides it from itself, from itself. Yeah. This is yeah. not conspiracy. This is the deep inner workings of psychology. It's contradictory. Like, uh, it's not it, true or right. It's just the way it is, right? Yeah, but, but kind of like the goal is... We should not get to the place where we realize that, you know, the the amount of debt or the two hundred plus trillion in unfunded liability is actually a real out. thing. Like, it's mental illness. That's why right? you see. The like we don't illness. want to get there. That's the point, right? We're to, already to there. That. We're already yeah, there. but I mean, like to the realization <laughs> of the fact. Look that, around you. These are yeah. all all these sludge <laughs> people, right? All mm -hmm. of the NPCs you see around you, all of the hypnosis that you see around you, is a consequence of our society not being able to come to grips with what it is. Exactly. And yeah, that's, that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah. It, it permeates everything, right? It yeah. permeates everything. Now, Bitcoiners have this ability. It ends up looking like this, right? You end up seeing that the, the I call it us banking versus our banking. Right? So we've created this us system, and it really is whoever's close to it, right? You've got the fiat communication nodes trying to perpetuate the war machine, trying to perpetuate the institutions, maintain the oil, but it's not clicking. And that's why you have these internal tensions within the sludge people minds, right? That's why you've got these British people celebrating that the racists are finally going to prison, finally, right? So you've got all this conflict that just becomes induced, whereas Bitcoiners understand through our network, through the the, the lulls of it all, right? It's pretty funny watching the fiat apocalypse. Like, it's kind of hilarious, right? Watch them freak out. Yeah. Uh, wait till the housing market crashes, right? They can't handle 15% downswing on their weird red fin aggregators. That ain't going to be pretty, right? Now, again, go back to psychology. Look at what Bitcoiners have been through. A 15% drop in Bitcoin. I mean, I get excited. I'm like, yes. Dude, three weeks ago with this yes. big stock market crash, there were PhDs <laughs> on CNBC saying, uh, um, like, just in panic, right? Yeah. Like, it yeah. can't go down. It can't go down. It should eventually go up, right? And oh, I, no. <laughs> It's wild. Much. That's wild. Yeah. But then you already know, like this already, I hope, you know, I think this is also my goal with the podcast is we want to create these little touch points where people are like, hmm, that's interesting, right? And and like, for example, that example of the PhD on CNBC saying like, oh no, 10% down, like think to yourself, what game are you playing if it can't go down 10%? Mm -hmm. What, you know, what what else is behind that? Why, can, wh why can't that happen? You know, think it, about it's that. It's what I, the, one of the frames I've used to understand why Bitcoin won or is winning um, has always been the human capital migrations into Bitcoin. Mm. So the first were those cryptographers. That that's why I was so impressed by them. They were the first people there. They were you know a few of them were on the Satoshi 
mailing list. And they were the first because they had been waiting for cryptographically based money for a long time. So they're the first to leave whatever career they were in, join our industry and build the industry. The political people were next, right? The, the people that, that got off the Ron Paul 2012 campaign went right into Bitcoin. They're still there. I know a lot of them. Um, but the next group were the Wall Street people about a particular breed of Wall Street person. And it's what you were just referring to, right? And that is the people who want real risk. There are some people that want to fuck for real. They don't want a porno. They can't handle it. That's not the real thing. And when they de-risked Wall Street the way they did in 08, they turned the game into porno, fake, right? The, the risk was kind of, you were not really going to impregnate a woman or get an STD or do anything like that. You were kind of just whacking off in front of your screen. It wasn't real anymore. And so there were people, the best of them, right? The best of them, the people that want the real thing, actual risk. I can lose and I can win, but at least I'm playing the real psychological game, not a mm. fake game, not a toy game, not a pretend game. There are people. And, you know, I would put Arthur Hayes on this list. Arthur Hayes is someone who wanted to fuck for real. And he built the craziest casino you've ever seen mm -hmm. because you got to be able to do the real risk. And that is where the psychological growth has come from. We've risked for real. We've seen the bottom. I've seen the floor. I've seen it. Like when the whole thing happened with SBF, I was not so far away from that dumpster fire in, in a good way and sort of pushing people to figure out what was going on and what I suspected and, and mm. all that stuff. And when I saw what was coming of it, how the flames burned i said well it'll be worth it anyway like i don't care if it goes down to a thousand dollars we're getting them the fuck out of here i'm yeah. not listening to a fat vegan tell me what to do anymore i'm not listening to his opinions on bitcoin he's the fuck out of here right we're not doing it. so yeah I, I love this approach to thinking why bitcoin is winning because the bitcoiners are playing this game and the other people playing the other game they cannot even um, they they will never commit to this real risk game. Well, right? they, so they won't. But there's more to it. There's the personal growth part. So so mm -hmm. you know, I wrote that book, the Bitcoiner's Guide to NPC Management. It's 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 all these techniques, right? It's not arguing. Yeah, I love it. We try to push it <laughs> max. You know, we try to. It's called embrace and amplify, right? So with with one of your credentialist friends, right? You know. You say to them, one of my favorite ones is to spread the don't trust verify meme. And it works more, it works better in America because they usually fall for the 2020 election was totally amazing. Mm -hmm. And so I always go, yeah, aren't we lucky? Aren't we lucky in America that all 50 states, all of them got the election right? Jeez, you know, that that's something else, man. Wow. You know, but I'm glad of it. I'm glad we got it. So in that way, you can, you can push to absurdities that don't trust verify me. Cause the only way in the end to get these people to wake up, not argument. One of the way you can shake the NPC out of their hypnosis is called embrace and amplify. You take the extremes of the absurd world and you basically just fucking snap them together and let things explode. And one of the ways you can do that is by pitying credentialist people, right? You pity them, you know, ah. I'm really sorry this was done to you, that you believe these things. I'm so sorry this happened. I'm so sorry that <laughs> yeah. that you think that the dollar is like a bloodless instrument in America. I'm sorry you believe the news. It's not easy. I can't can't imagine what it's like, man, what you've been through the past couple of years, thinking there's Nazis everywhere. and It's just not easy. Man. I, 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 I'm with you. I'm with you. And so that these techniques work way better than arguing with people, right? Mm-hmm. The sports ballers, right? The people who are like, it's too con, like those, I would put those, uh, those tax people you mentioned earlier as like sports ballers, right? That it's too complicated. I, I lost money. I didn't know nothing about that finance stuff. I'm just a tax guy, right? You know, that with them, it's the same thing. You don't argue, you know, you got to get into it. You go, you're going to lose that bad. <laughs> okay. You know, you're, <laughs> you're not, you're yeah. not going to win any, right? None. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. You gotta make fun of these people. You just, there's no way to argue literally. But, but here's where things get better and why I think Bitcoiners have a separate advantage. It's not just that they're NPC sludge people. When I'm talking about playing to win, I'm writing a sort of flip side to the NPC management thing, which is the Bitcoiners guide to the fiat apocalypse. So how we survive the fiat apocalypse. And 
Now, this is just something that I that I threw up. I do a lot of these whiteboards on my show, right? I put whiteboards together all the time. Love it. That's my place in Vermont from a couple of... Um, but I was just talking about the order of things, right? A top-down structure, the state and feudalism, you know, crown to the holdings, to the army, to the person. And nationalism was somewhat different, right? You got the politicians and the in- institutions, and then finally there, and then you get the soldiers at the bottom. But then, of course, Bitcoin created this bottom-up thing, right? Where if the money's on the bottom, you can actually have exceptional people who leverage the money to then do exceptional things. Mm. So it kind of changes the order of how you become exceptional. You don't have to suck ass to get up here. You don't have to suck ass to get up here. You can just be awesome and start realizing all kinds of manifestations of heaven on earth through your own abilities, right? You can bring that to earth through your exceptional skills. That, that was always the case. There was always some people who could be exceptional. So it's, we don't have a monopoly on exceptionalism. But as fiat crumbles, we have one of the only pathways out. And one of those, again, to go into the union archetypes, in the same way that I use the NPC archetypes, right? I talked about credentialists being an NPC archetype, uh, followers being one, sports ballers, Karens, nihilists, right? There's a collection of archetypes that you can actually identify with as a Bitcoiner that will help you be successful as fiat continues to collapse. These are those positive roles and and positions you can take in society. We're already seeing them. You're doing one of them, right? So you can already think of fatherhood as a really important archetype that Bitcoiners have embraced. It's not just from the family level. Look at the education. That is a very fatherly thing to do to become a podcaster, to become someone who's trying through contemplation, through public speaking, through uh, the, the framework of, of teaching, who can do that, right? That The mm. father archetype is very important in Bitcoin. I would say Andreas Antonopoulos embraced it heavily, right? Running around the world the way he did. There's something, you know, bad about it. And then even go further, look at the toxic maximalism, right? The memes if you don't think that toxic maximalism, just a father saying to you, you're fucking dumb, you're stupid, you're a fucking retard, you're dumb, and that's not going to work. That's really important education, the kind you can only get from a father. Now, a woman can do it too. I don't mean to say these are exclusive things, but the, the harsh truth that toxic maxis give out and dish out is part of the fatherhood um, archetype, right? It's just keeping it real. It's keeping right. it real, but, but there's more, yeah. right? The mother, the motherhood one, right? When people say Satoshi is female, well, the ultimate sacrifice of just abandoning the project for its betterment, that's a mother. Oh, there's not many other vibes out there that could get you to that level, except for the type of sacrifice motherhood induces, mm. right? That's there. You got, you got the brothers, the bro science health people. You got the, the, asymmetric information that I mentioned earlier with Lynn Alden and you know, that's sort of sisterhood stuff. And, and who else does, who else shares their homework like that? <laughs> who does that? Yeah, what industry does like the top student just be like, Hey, I got all your work here. Take my, take my homework, take my homework. But we get in a Bitcoin, sense, you know? yeah, in a sense, it's kind of like, a, like a fractal of the incentive game that Bitcoin eventually uh, yes, shows, yeah, right? Yeah. Like it's just yeah. a certain level of aligned incentives and people act, they are shown these incentives and then they act upon it, right? And the the trickster, right? You're seeing people make uh, an entire career out of just being complete fun, running around borders, being an outlaw, laughing about it, right? (laughs) Like we're godly. It's It's a godly thing against the fiat sludge people. And then the pleb, the pleb is the everyman, the pleb mm-hmm. who just shows up and does what they can. That is a powerful archetype in Jungian psychology and a powerful one to get you through the fiat apocalypse, one that many have embraced and the one you can see is successful. The person who just does the revolutionary act in the fiat collapse, which is doing what you say you're going to do, <laughs> you know how hard that is these days to find someone who just like shows up and like does the thing they said they were going to do. It's almost impossible. I mean, it's it, literally isn't it also possible. funny that the bar's dead low? Isn't well, that isn't that a signal for showing the? You mentioned like spiritual war before. I I would I agree. So. I, I I talked to Tu de Maester. So. He also said, "I'm going to use the word war more, right?" Because the, the the fact that the bar is dead low, right? Someone is is going to do what they say they're going to do. 
right? Like, what? How can we build a future world when we are below that bar? I don't you think know? we need many sludge people to do it. Um, I think we can. Mm. I think we've never seen what happens when we have something like the internet and Bitcoin and exactly this type of proliferation of individual sovereignty. The yeah. sovereign individuals that occur now in this time are not the same as the ones that came about a generation ago. Because worldwide, of the, by the way. Worldwide, right. yeah, worldwide. I mean, yeah. absolutely worldwide. Yeah, it, mm. it's, it's a worldwide thing. Yeah. And, and I mean, in fact, I, I think you're going to keep seeing Americans abandon America because the citizenship of sovereignty is way more valuable than the American citizen right so yeah you're going to continue to see that what once was the most valuable citizenship in the world is now being denied by many of the people who have it right they don't even want it anymore because they want to be one of these bitcoiners that runs all around the world and doesn't have to pay taxes because they're smart right well and bitcoin is of course also just the network state already i would say right so yeah. anywhere you would want to go or go you can find other people that share your your values, I think, in many cases. And um, that will actually make it easier for you also to actually go to a different place, right? Like it is the lifeboat in that sense, not only the asset itself, but the entirety of, of the people around it as well. Yeah, I don't, I don't think if El Salvador wouldn't exist, for example, I don't think I would have as much risk tolerance as I do. Um, I, I don't think I would be, you know, I, I'm pretty outspoken on X and on YouTube and on Rumble and I do this kind of stuff every day. And uh, I don't think I would if if I didn't have a place like El Salvador, which existed. Right? I'm, I'm confident that I can defend myself mm. in America, but you never know. Right? You just never know. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I keep my mind on the farm and the guns. <laughs> Every now and again, they're there in case, mm -hmm. right? But uh, if El Salvador wasn't there, uh, I don't know what I would be. I, don't, I think I'd be singing a different tune, even though I've only been once and I'm not, I'm not planning on moving there or anything like that. But it does allow us, that one little crack of light allows us to have that worldview now that's 100% Bitcoin, because indeed we are a, a network state with a strong foundation in, in a real nation. Yeah. So how, why do you believe, uh, you, you shared this with me before, um, and I can guess, but I'd love to know, like, why do you believe someone's initial reaction to Bitcoin is so revealing about the worldview, uh, that they have before we started recording, I shared an example that I just had today with someone on Twitter, you know, I don't know what it said, management consultant, the uh, blockchain, something, something in his bio. Um, but I explained to him, uh, why fiat uh, is uh, pro-war, right? And if you're anti-Bitcoin, you're pro-war. And he told me I was naive, etc. How, how how do you look at this, these reactions? Well, again, it's the, the eye of the beholder in the sense that they're telling you more about what they're afraid of, more about the nature of their dreams, more about their own psychological problems than anything they have with Bitcoin. So I call it the mirror of disbelief, so that when you see their reason for criticizing, you can actually take that reason and, and interpret it as a type of projection. They're actually telling you what psychological deficiency they have. They see it in Bitcoin. They think they see a deficiency in Bitcoin, uh, but this is a signal of someone who actually believes that the, the props of the fiat system are reality, wealth, status. Yeah. None of those things are real. So I love that. They're, yeah. they're, they're taking the props of the fiat world, calling them reality and then judging against that. So what you end up seeing is a, a mirror to their own inside. So when you hear a credentialist say, Oh, governments are going to ban it, right? Well, they don't understand the weakness of the governments, right? They don't understand the incompetence or they're not willing to face it. I'm not sure what yeah. the answer is. Yeah. Or they Again, hope they are problem. competent. Yeah, yeah, well, they're, that, oh, they're that praying. Yeah, like, like I said, everyone, like, thank God, all fifty elections were great, right? Thank God. Yeah. Um, you know, the follower, for example, it's always right. My friend lost some money, and it's a scam. And I don't. What are people going to say? 
They're going to laugh at me. Well, we've trained ourselves in Bitcoin to be laughed at by people for years. It's it's still happening, believe it or not. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's still happening, right? Like people are still like, oh, that Bitcoin thing you got going on, right? And I'm like, that Bitcoin, when's it gonna, when is it going to take over, No one. When is yeah. it taking over? And I'm like, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. and then you just can't argue because yeah. these people, they, and they've already had the the arrogant sandwich a couple of times for me. I've already delivered mm. it to them. Like, <laughs> you know how fucking much richer I am than you, you idiot. You know, like that kind of stuff. And they can't handle it. So, but they'll forget it two seconds later. They'll just forget it. And they'll go back to something that the newspaper said, laughing at Bitcoiners, and they'll think that everyone, la- <laughs> you know, they're, yeah, but they're, they're easily confused by that stuff. I, I like the mirror um, concept because, yeah, it, it is really psychological, right? Like once you are confronted with the fact that you might not know everything, right? Or what you think is true is not true, right? That is a scary realization, Right. And so an initial reaction, if you haven't done work on yourself, I would say, is the cope reaction, right? And that is, uh, you know, you're, you're a Bitcoin bro or uh, like, uh, I love the one where people say, yeah, if the if the internet gets shut down, you know, <laughs> then it's all <laughs> going to crap. <laughs> That's so funny. It's so funny. It's so funny. <laughs> and, and and actually, I had, a, I had a conversation with someone a few weeks ago where... Um, they were, they are all into stocks and all these things. And um, eventually we were talking about Bitcoin and they said like, okay, but what if like Russia drops a nuke? I said, what if Russia drops a nuke? Are you going to call your stock broker and be like, <laughs> I want to cash out like my Tesla stock. I know the the the, the Nasdaq is closed, <laughs> yeah, but- you know, I know it's closed, but I still want to cash out. Like I have a serious problem, you know? And then they <laughs> looked at me, they looked at me and they were like, God damn, he's right, you know, and oh. and that was just a really funny. In, it, it, but but they didn't go against me. They they just they had the moment where they were like, "Huh, he's right, I'm wrong," and and it didn't trigger them. We had a really nice conversation afterwards, but it was really interesting to see that there's different people that that react in a different way. Where yeah, some people will just then go to you know the next argument at the end of the line. There's two arguments at the end of the line for me. One is like the nuclear bomb one, right? And the other one is the turning off the internet one. Um, but in in this conversation, it actually continued pretty nicely. But I think that is, I think what we also should invite people to. Like, I'm not better than you. I'm not smarter than you or whatever. Like, it's not about that. It's totally yeah. not about that, right? It's about this re- journey of reflection and just understanding that the people in charge are just other people, right? And you grow up in a certain system that shows you stuff, repeats stuff to you, so you are programmed in that way, right? And you can change yourself. One of the disarming things that I do use, when when you get into those conversations, so indeed I try to induce cognitive dissonance, right? I try to hit them where they where they start saying things like, what if there's a nuclear bomb? And, you know, because that, that stuff comes out when they're doubting their worldview. Now, before I continue, I'll just say that whenever I feel that sickness in my stomach because someone says something crazy about politics or fiat money or fake news, I've learned to train myself to know what cognitive dissonance feels like physically in my own body. It basically is that feeling that you don't like someone's opinion, right? And we get, so Bitcoiners get it all the time. So we're not immune to it. And I, I always got to remember that, right? We get it too. We, we, we can get better sources of direction and answer after, but it's a big part of how we see yes. the world as well, right? Yes. We're not, we're not immune to it. All right. So, um, what was I saying about the, the, um, cognitive back to the, dissonance. the cognitive dissonance, but about, oh yeah, th- th- this example, I, I think anyway, helps me a lot and it helps when, once you're at that point of mutual, like what's the big picture for Bitcoin? What does this really mean? Stocks and all that stuff. I try to let them know, that, that one of the horrors, the absolute horrors of fiat money has been the following, that the best and brightest of any culture, of any time, whatever planet, whatever nation, whatever culture, the best and brightest will go into the job that pays the most money. It's just a fact, right? We don't, we don't have to get too detailed yeah. on it. The smartest people will go to the most money on an aggregate. 
Now, what we ended up doing in America for a whole generation was the best and brightest went into financial engineering. The best and brightest went into Wall Street and all these things. And it required this really high IQ to participate. And it became a status symbol. It meant that not only were you rich, you had the intellectual capacity to compete at the highest level. You were in, you were playing in the major, whatever you call it in Europe for soccer. You were playing in the premier league of soccer, right? <laughs> And people don't want to be relegated. They don't want to be in the second place thing. Now, when I talk to just normal people, not even people that are in stock markets and whatever, what I say to them and what Bitcoin is offering and what Bitcoin is bringing is an end to that. We are bringing yeah. an end to the highest IQ required to participate in financial markets. We're making it easy again to have to save money. And that just changes the order of things. I don't think we're going to stop all financial engineering, but it won't be the best and brightest collectively that go in there. I hope a few smart people go in there. Maybe there's some stuff to do. I don't know. Um, but th this becomes pretty disarming. <laughs> this becomes pretty disarming for people because you're not actually arguing the merits of Bitcoin or you're not arguing things that there are going to be shut off about, right? The, the technicalities of 51% attacks and don't trust verify. None of this stuff is going to work right away on person you got to get them the big picture and the big picture is we just want to make life simple again the reason it's not simple is the financial engineers have distorted the cost of living distorted the cost of participating in the society because of the things they did without even realizing it doesn't have to be conspiracy no one was yeah, out to, yeah, mean to you total accidents right this is this is entropy at work this is what it looks like a system at the end and so I find this to be really disarming and it can show the NPC something other than, oh, I think it's the best and we're going to get finality and price discovery and capital allocation. None of this stuff. This sounds like more Wall Street, right? The argument that I'm making is that we're making it simple. We want to get rid of the high IQ required to save money. We want to yeah. make it easy. Be a good chairperson, making chairs, <laughs> save your money. Exactly right? this. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, and if, if Bitcoin exists like that, it will continue to act as a mirror for, you know, whatever other financial system other people want to start, right? But the fact that uh, Bitcoin is so transparent, uh, and, and verifiable, right? That's the entire point. And, uh, until someone comes up with uh, something that's, uh, easier to verify in whatever way that <laughs> that's possible, right? This is the, most honest, open um, monetary asset that anyone can use to save their uh, wealth across time and space. And I think that's it, right? I think also that's why it's so hard to understand. Eventually, it's very, very simplistic, right? It's just a set of rules Absolutely. that's checked every yeah. 10 times. Yeah, and that's, that, that's the frustrating it. part. That's but the frustrating I, part. Yes, but again, the bar is that low. So it sounds way too good to be true, right? Once you hear this, you're like, Okay, no, 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 because this other system that I know are working, right, is crazy complicated. Period. Complexity theater, it's going to need the end. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. Turing complete. Yes, <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> All right, I want to be mindful of your time. So I have, <laughs> I have like three, four more questions, if that's okay. Um, so we are entering, you know, the debt spiral is accelerating. We are entering this end of fiat quicker and quicker. You know, it's, it's, it's un an unstoppable thing. What's the next major challenge of Bitcoiners in terms of managing NPCs, helping them also? And Well, this election is yeah. going to be tough. The election is going to be uh, a real uh, zinger in the sense that we're already seeing the brainwashing at scale in America. I mean, I don't think Europeans quite understand the type of... I watch of a lot. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah but, I know. but the, the saturation of American politics and American daily mm. life, it's, it's just, you don't you can't imagine the amount of money that's being spent to the amount of fiat sludge money that's being spent to persuade people to hypnotize them, manipulate them. The amount of, um, you know, basically the architecture of deceit is what I call the, the system of media propagation in the United States. And the, the true nature of it, the contours of it are having to reveal itself because it's dying, because it's dying, right? Yeah. The death spirals yeah. up so high, the, Whatever is going on looks like it's it's part of the birth certificate scam where the more people you have admitted to the United States, the more debt you're allowed to go in, right? Every time they issue a social security number, 
they're able to go into debt further. It moves up the debt ceiling. So they're able to manipulate how much America goes into debt by manipulating the census and the amount of people that are in America. However, they came in, it doesn't matter. It's just more collateral, right? And yeah. so the, um, the psychological war that's coming to fight against this is going to be crazier than ever. But this is why I think Bitcoin is going to end up in the middle of this. this is why I really do believe that we're going to have a major role to play in upgrading American psychology, really, around this election. And it is the don't trust verify meme. Imagine that we're being told we have elections in America, but we can't audit them. We don't know how to, there is no plan to audit. There's no idea of auditing it. So what's going to happen this time is we're going in to the actually- In the greatest democracy in the world, it's not possible. <laughs> Sorry. You know, it's not even, they don't even, there's not even, there's not even, there's not even a, there's not even a plan to audit, right? But it sounds so, so ridiculous, don't you think? I just only it, that sentence, it's absolutely right? absolutely ridiculous. It's wild. So, but if you didn't know Don't Trust Verify, mm. you wouldn't be able to even explain this. And this yeah. can only be done medically because this yeah, is really complicated stuff, right? And hard to keep in your mind. Now, what I do predict is going to happen is you're going to have, it should have happened in 2020, but I don't know if people realize this. Before there was poly market, the only major prediction market that ran for the 2020 election was FTX. It's what made the FTX name, right? FTX name was made in the week following the election where cognitive closure, what I call cognitive closure was induced by showing the FTX prediction market graph. I'm saying the non-sentimental gamblers have chosen Joe Biden in turn because they weren't that way before. But only a handful of people knew what I knew, which was that FBF, SBF was Biden's largest foreign donor and that the liquidity in the book was only about $1.5 million that had been bet. That it was nothing like Polymarket is today betting oh, on wow. election mm -hmm. at the scale. And so I was at Kraken saying we should copy this, thinking like a media person coming from Coindesk saying this brand name is going to be all over the airwaves because... You can only put on so many talking heads after the election. It's the same shit. You're going to want to put this data point up because it means something, just like you're seeing it today. It means something, right? The prediction markets mean something. So we were not able to get to that world last time because that market was scammed. It was, he put his finger on it and manipulated the market. There were probably five people in the world who understood what was happening. Arthur Hayes would have been one of them. I would have been one of them. We were a very small group of people that understand that they had used a shitty, crypto prediction market to steal partly steal the election and so now i was ha i was fine with it right I'm, I'm i was not i never cried about it for one day i as a bitcoiner and an accelerationist i will vote for joe biden five times again if it if i could right because it's the fastest way to get bitcoin going right? it's not for his bright ideas that i'm voting for him mm -hmm. it's because it's perfect who would you rather have selling the u.s dollar in the u.s system than these fucking people the problem with Trump is he's too good. He would be too good at the dollar. We would be nowhere with that with Trump in 2020. Bitcoin, what we're experiencing in 2021, late 2020, early 2021, was smart, rich people around the world realizing that the U.S. was now a scam country and they mm -hmm. needed to start hedging. And that's what caused the pump of 2021. And so here we are again. And this time, I don't think it buckles like it did last time. They're not going to be able to throw up an SPF scam graph and say the non-sentimental people believe Joe Biden won the election. So you're going to have an actual psychological war that happens after this. You might even have two presidents. And you're going to get into the machine versus Trump. And the only hope Trump has, he has one hope in all of this, which is get the Bitcoiners to argue for him for him that don't trust verify is the only thing we need to know. We have, we will never have proof that the election is stolen. It's too easy to hide. Individuals are cheating because they believe Hitler's in charge of America. I expect mm. nothing less. They, they believe this stuff, right? These are not evil people. The people who are helping steal the election are just victims of the system, but they, they, but they believe it, right? They live in this mm. psychosis that, that Nazis are running America. And so of course it's natural. They would want to defend it, but that's the next, fight is that Bitcoiners in the middle of this, this is not getting involved in politics. If they choose to ignore reality, they can, that's fine. And it might be the way they do it, right? They might just say, no, 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 we're going to go with this. That's fine. doesn't matter if we can't verify the elections. Uh, Kamala is just the best. And I will embrace that too, because it's accelerationism. And the truth is four more years of these rotten people 
it's it's the worst outcome in terms of human misery um you know we'll, we'll get to the same place no matter what trump slows down the process a little and i think saves some lives uh so i prefer that i 100 percent prefer it um and i love kennedy for similar reasons uh, as i love trump i, I think he, he can he can stretch out the time it takes to transition transition to save some lives but I'm okay with hitting pedal to the metal and going mm. Kamala Harris, guys. Price controls. She keeps making the deal sweeter. Price controls now? Price controls on groceries? Let fucking rock and roll. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. I want them in. Yeah, Come on. What I What I want to add to that is I, I think it's interesting that it already permeates in, in t- t- to some degree to some media, right? I mean, you saw the Washington Post talk about the ridiculousness of the price control uh, proposal, oh, I which I love is <laughs> interesting already, right? So um, I feel like it's it's now so overtly communist in a sense that even the people in media on, you know, whatever it's called, the left side are like, Oh, is this really, is this really what we want? Right. And what I, by the way, find fascinating is when, when Balaji Srinivasan talks about not only the network state, right? But he talks also about like history is going in reverse. I don't know if you know that, but he, he, he talks a lot about that. It's I'm like a simulation guy too. So I'm, I'm a yeah, big, uh, so like, okay. So yeah. America is getting a, uh, becoming a communist country and China is becoming like a fiscally responsible. Um, you know, leader of a group of countries that are going to have their own currency. It's a, what, what is happening? You know, it's, it's well, yeah. so, so ultimately that's, that's where Bitcoin comes in. That my prediction is the following. Mm. Right? America embraces chaos of whatever's coming next. The dollar can no longer be a reference for global energy markets. The BRICS thing also fails because no one has, these people are credible either. And Bitcoin simply becomes a settlement layer and reference for the global energy markets because it's neutral. It's third, you know, not yeah. a country and everyone can agree on it. And energy from there, you know, cause just look at Nord Stream, right? Just look at the whole Nord Stream thing that's happening. I'm sure everyone's talking about it in Holland right now. And cause Holland's okay with it, right? <laughs> Ukraine did it, but we're going to keep paying. Don't worry. Don't worry. In the end, forget whoever they say did it. In the end, American energy company. All right. Yeah. Uh, because in the end, American energy, energy companies backstopped it. American energy companies said to whoever actually did do it, don't worry. No one in Europe is going without the heat over the winter. We can do this. We have enough energy. So no matter what, the final go, no go was U.S. energy company. All right. So they actually run the world. They actually run whatever that army thing that the money finances war and all that. That's them, right? That's them. It's not even the deep state. Forget about them for a second. Something else is going. Now, as long as they want to stay rich and as long as they don't want their money turning into food stamps, we got them by the nuts and there's nothing they can do about it. There's nothing they can do about it because eventually they need money to show that they're rich. They need money for their markets to perpetuate and there's only going to be one. And yeah. so as long as we make sure that rich people reference their wealth in Bitcoin, I, you know, I've not. It's what COVID taught me. It's a sad truth, right? Uh, I used to think maybe we had a chance with the remittance thing and then the plebs of the world all get 0.1 Bitcoins and then we have a revolution and blah, blah, blah. That's not going to happen, right? It's yeah. just not. Like yeah. COVID, there's too many stupid people. It's too terrible. Uh, we have some form of, of people who have broken off that are a type of elite just because they know how to survive and, and they have their own survival mechanisms. And then we've got the wealthy. And that's what the ETF is about. And then we've got the energy company. That's what the, the, the markets are going to be all about. And Bitcoin's going to dominate those. And we're going to take those two industries next. We've already taken Wall Street. We're going to take the energy industry entirely. And once that happens, they can't tell us what to do anymore. It's over. So it doesn't matter if Kamala wins. If Kamala ends, we go, wins, we go even closer to the energy companies. We survive and we win in a, a, a very rough way. I don't want to win that. Yeah. One, but we can do it. Well, if Kamala wins, I just saw a tweet and I'll read it to you. Kamala, considering SEC Chair Gary Gensler for Treasury Secretary, oh, is elected. Please, we want him more and more, <laughs> Gary. Please. He used to beg me for work, Gary Gensler. It's so funny for me to see this. 
Hey, well, can I get a job? Before this scam party took over, he was just some dumb reject at MIT who wanted, he wrote one article for us before he got appointed at Coindesk. He did, we did hire him for one already? article. Yeah, go check it out. He wrote for Coindesk. Harry Gensler wrote for Coindesk in 2019. Well, this is his, um, his uh, reward for um, oh, letting the ETCFs go through. Please, right? simulation. Yeah. Yeah. Please. All right. We love Trump. We love him. We love him. We don't, we want it, you know, we love Kennedy. We love Trump. But God, Gensler would be fine. Well, let's see how it goes. It's entertaining, right? As we alluded sure. to before. And uh, well, the most uh, entertaining outcome is the, is the most likely as well. So let's see. Let's see. All yeah, right. I, I want to ask you my last question because then um, you can go spend time with the family. And I wanted to ask you uh, a question that I ask everyone at the end which is, what is a core belief that you will never let go? Oh, well, I think that that might be it. You just said it. You actually stole it from me. I think a core belief is the most entertaining outcome, is the most likely. It's actually guided most of my predictions in Bitcoin. And most of the things that I've believed would happen, you know, even take, for example, getting Trump at the Bitcoin show this summer. You know, we put that event between the two conventions the way we did because the theory was the biggest party in the world coming off of the republican nomination either trump is killed before then and they tried to the week before so either he's dead and what we have to do then is just be the most entertaining place for political signups because it's all ballot harvesting it's all just getting out the vote so if we're the biggest gathering of Americans the week after the Republican convention and the week before the Democrat one, we're going to get Donald Trump. It's just, that's what's going to happen. It's just, it's the most entertaining outcome. There's nothing we can, we can't decide. So you can actually go and check on my show from 2023. I'm saying this publicly, like he's going to show up. I don't know what to say. We're going to get, I, I, that's what's, that's what the numbers are telling me that he's coming to the show because it's the most entertaining possible thing that can happen in Bitcoin in 2024 the physics of the rate of decay of the fiat system are going to necessitate that he becomes a Bitcoiner, that the red and blue uh, conversion to green and orange will mostly be complete by then, and he'll have no choice. It's just the most entertaining outcome. And I've used the most entertaining outcome for Bitcoin from the beginning, because you got to remember, go back to the early days, you, you know, you were there. You can, it was like, okay, we're going to take on global finance and the entire system of money and you're like, okay, I'm free on weekends. I could, we could probably do this. Yeah. Like, I could probably, yeah. like, I could probably figure this out, right? Okay, let me just like work a little bit of an extra job. Pretty sure by like eight years from now, we'll have the whole disgusting thing on the ropes, ready to pull out its spine, right? Now that was the most entertaining outcome. You could have only embarked on the psycho mission that most Bitcoiners did years ago if you believed <laughs> that the most entertaining outcome was the most likely and we did. So we got there. Love that, man. And uh, yeah, thanks so much for your time. I really enjoyed this conversation. I think the psychology of Bitcoin adoption, uh, we, we should definitely have another recording, maybe after the elections, because I think that uh, that would be fun <laughs> to, to jam about. I will link to your podcast, the MPC guy. And let me know if I got a, um, these are some of the, these are some of my, I do a lot of thumbnails every day with the AI, you know, there's yeah, some over. Nice. Um, old Trump ones. Um, I won't play the audio, but this is something I launched recently, which are royalty tokens. So please let the audience go see this. You can actually get a royalty token for some Bitcoin science fiction stories that I've written. So you can see some of the images here. It's all narrated and oh, very uh, cool. there's some books coming out. So the basic gist of it is that if people go and this is the mint page, we're doing it on Bitcoin using the RBC uh, the the really good Bitcoin RGB plus uh, plus protocol. So it's native Bitcoin. There's no bridges. There's no Ethereum stuff. It's real Bitcoin counterparty esque minting. So I had to actually mint with Bitcoin. I had to you know use Bitcoin to do this. Mm. So uh, you can mint. Uh, I think there is a bit of a fee with things, but it shouldn't be too much. And uh, yeah, basically the point is you're get an art token for enjoying the culture. It's free. You get it for buying a book. 
Uh, I'm going to try and hijack the Amazon algorithm to sell books this way. So if you get enough people with a token and then you can convince the Amazon algorithm to sell the book because it rewards early sales. So if I've basically done an airdrop with the early buyers, then you can spin the algorithm to sell the book. Then I take that fiat in dollars and I put it into an automated market maker and your token that you got for free just for liking the Bitcoin sci-fi is actually your rights to the Bitcoin in the pool. So you can withdraw mm. Bitcoin with the pros, right? So we want to kill the hipster affectation of denying your fandom when someone becomes popular. Oh, oh I was a fan, but then they became popular. So what you're going to get in this way is people yeah. will brag, you know how rich that guy is? He was at the first concert. He was at the first thing. He was at the first whatever. I love that. So that's basically how it would work. So uh, you can check that out. It's the one that I have right now. is called Art One, the token. Uh, I'll be issuing more. I've got, I'll be doing them for all these books. So the Bitcoiner's Guide to NPC Man, the Bitcoiner's Guide to the Fiat Apocalypse, and uh, two sci-fi books, Satoshi Wedding Murders and Blue Moon Orange Coin are all going to get the token treatment. And we're going to pump that Amazon algorithm. Love that. Awesome, man. Thanks again. And uh, we'll stay in touch. Peace, man. Cheers. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, check out some of my other episodes to learn why Bitcoin is the most important subject you must understand and adopt. If you want, you can follow and connect with me on Twitter X. I'm at Bram K. That's at B-R-A-M-K. And if you have any feedback or questions, just reach out. I read and reply to every single message. I appreciate your support and hope you'll be here for our next episode. Thanks for listening. Bye.